Hello and welcome back. This is the week seven lecture. So today we move on from close reading. I hope you guys don't forget about what we've been doing over the last two weeks, but we are moving on to some new material. Just hang on to what we've learned about though with close reading so you can apply that uh, so you can use that on future assignments. But starting here in week seven, we are moving into our literary criticism and theory unit. So we're going to spend about four weeks on this stuff. And I want to talk a little bit about our schedule and how we're going to sort of break this up over the course of the next month or so. So beginning here in week seven, I just want to provide a pretty general overview of literary criticism and literary theory because as we're going to see here today those two terms mean slightly different things there is a lot of overlap between them but there is you know a, an important distinction to be made between the two terms so they're a little bit different we're going to cover both sort of together over the next several weeks. So I'll introduce some key concepts today. We'll just sort of talk about this stuff in general terms and we'll talk about our upcoming schedule and how we're gonna cover everything in a little bit more detail starting next week. Uh, so by the time we get to the end of this unit, you guys should be comfortable with at least some of these different critical schools or approaches that we're going to be learning about. And some of this stuff might strike you as review. It might feel a little bit like review because most of you probably learned at least a little bit about criticism and theory back in English 203 and maybe in some previous, you know, some additional previous English classes as well. So hopefully not all of this stuff is brand new. Some of it should seem familiar, at least somewhat familiar from a previous class. But I do want us to get a little bit more in depth with some of these approaches and strategies as opposed to maybe what we've done in the past. I know in 203, just in my own 203 classes, I tend to, you know, present all of this stuff and we do learn about it. But, uh, you know, the expectations as far as how much students are going to use it, uh, those expectations remain you know, pretty low in a 200 level class, but now that we are at the 300 level, we should have a higher level of proficiency with this stuff. Uh, you know, we should be comfortable enough to use it not only on our next SAR, but also, of course, on our final paper, our literary research paper. So using at least one of these schools or approaches will ultimately help you to generate more original analysis. Uh, it will help you to produce that literary research paper at the end of the semester. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how we're going to sort of get organized or how we're going to cover a lot of material over the next few weeks. So we can't necessarily do all of these different schools of criticism and theory justice uh, because we are sort of moving quickly. We're not going to be able to get to every single school. We're going to sort of use some broad strokes. Uh, so we're going to break up the different sort of schools, different critical schools or critical approaches. We're going to break those up into three general categories. Uh, starting next week, we're going to really begin with text-based approaches. So that is our first category, and that's going to include formalism, which we've already talked about a little bit. You know, the new critics, they gave us close reading as a practice, as a technique. So we talked about them. We've been talking about them over the last couple of weeks. So I've already given you a little bit of an introduction to formalism, but we will return to it next week as we get into our text-based approaches. So text-based approaches, that's just a broad term for any school of criticism or theory that's really focused on the text itself. Uh, the language of the text, the structure of the text, in some cases, the materiality of the text. Uh, so we'll get into all of that in more detail next week, but we've already seen a prime example of a text-based approach, which is, of course, formalism or what was called the new criticism. 
back when it first came onto the scene roughly 100 years ago. Like we said, it's not really new anymore, but it was new when it came onto the scene back in the 1930s because we know it was focused on the language of texts. Uh, that particular critical style was focused on the structure, the form of texts. And we talked about how the new critics were different from a lot of the practitioners of literary criticism that had come before them. And we talked about the main reason. It was important to keep that stuff in mind. What made them different is they were focused on a text as just being a work of art in and of itself. Remember, we said pre, you know, prior to them, a lot of the analysis of text, of literary text, would be conducted through the medium of other disciplines or sort of using the lens of other academic fields, other bodies of knowledge, right? So we would read literature in order to learn something about history or philosophy or religion, or perhaps the literature would sort of reinforce certain things having to do with those disciplines, or we could use the old biographical approach, read the literature through the lens of the author's life, talk about the author. So those were a lot of traditional approaches that had been around for a long time, using contexts, right, historical context, using the author's bio, and other things to sort of approach or appreciate the literature. And some of those things are fine. We still use some of those traditional approaches as we're going to find out. But what the new critic said is, hey, the language and the structure give us plenty to work with. We don't have to worry about all of these external factors, all of these outside contexts. Let's just think about the words, the metaphors, the punctuation, the symbols, the irony, all the stuff that we can find directly in the text. And of course, that's what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. We've been practicing our close reading. We've been using a lot of those formalist techniques. Now, as we've said, uh, modern people reject certain ideas of the formalists. Uh, we don't believe there's only one correct way to read a work of literature. We're not quite as snobby as they were, but we still use their technique of close reading. But just from what little we do know about them already, we can see that they are clearly a text-based school of criticism, right? They are mostly focused on the language, the form, the actual words on the page. Uh, so that's an example of a text-based style or approach of literary criticism. So we'll start there because they really sort of get things rolling, at least in terms of, you know, sort of modern American uh, study of literature. So we'll start with the formalists, but there's some other schools that are also text-based. So once we cover, uh, you know, formalism next week, we'll move into structuralism and post-structuralism, at least briefly. Those are two other schools that are really focused on the text itself, the language, uh, the patterns, the structures that govern texts. So it's kind of interesting to think about this as a little bit of a chronological journey through time. So next week, we're going to start with formalism or the new critics. And like I said, those guys rise to prominence really starting in like the 1930s up through the 1940s around the era of World War II. So we kind of start there. And formalism continues to be pretty popular up through the 1950s. OK, and then we move into structuralism and post-structuralism, which both sort of kind of develop in the over the course of the 1960s and 1970s. So as we know, there are a lot of changes happening in our society during the 60s and 70s and structuralism and particularly post-structuralism are very sort of connected to a lot of these sort of revolutionary changes, new ways of looking at the world, new voices being heard. Uh, they sort of are providing new ways of understanding the structures that govern language uh, and that really govern meaning in texts. So they're kind of tricky schools. We're not really going to be able to do them justice, but we will cover structuralism and post-structuralism next week because they are slightly more modern versions of text-based approaches to criticism and theory. So that will be week eight. That's what we're doing next week. So we return to the formalists and then we move into structuralism and then we conclude with post-structuralism. So 
That's week eight. Then we have spring break. We take a week off, which might be very helpful. We can recharge, but don't forget what we've been talking about because then we come back in week 10 and we're going to move, I'm sorry, week nine. We come back after the break for week nine and we move on to context-based critical approaches. So these are even more modern developments in literary criticism. So as we're going to see, as we move into the 1980s and 1990s, increasingly literary scholars are working with more context-based approaches. Uh, and we continue to use a lot of these today. So to use a context or contextual approach, that just means that you are analyzing a literary text through the examination of historical, social, or political developments and contexts. And those sort of outside things, those historical, political, or cultural factors or developments are often going to be reflected in the text or perhaps they influence the text. Uh, in, in interesting ways that you can explore. So there's a lot to cover with context or contextual based approaches. So we're going to talk about feminism and gender studies. We're going to talk about new historicism. We're going to talk about post-colonialism and cultural studies a little bit as well. So we're going to cram all of those into week nine. And again, we're not going to be able to cover them exhaustively or as thoroughly as I would like, but we'll at least get an overview of all of those different individual schools. But again, they're all linked together because they are ways of approaching text through history, through maybe, you know, political science, different social science approaches, but also we can use certain ideologies certain orientations towards the world to also provide us with sort of a critical lens uh, that we can use to approach a literary text. So <clears throat> again, context, uh, context-based approaches are very popular today. And there's actually a debate sort of raging right now. We can enter into it. You know, there's a debate in uh, within a lot of, you know, academic uh, literature uh, realms, sort of this debate between text-based approaches and context-based approaches. Some sort of old-fashioned literary scholars will sort of bemoan or lament the decline of text-based approaches. They'll say, you know, we don't really study language anymore. Everything's about history or politics or various cultural developments, and we're not engaging closely enough with the language. Whereas a lot more sort of young, uh, more modern scholars will say, you know, the language is fine and we can deal with it, but we also need to tend to these sort of larger currents uh, in American life or in sort of global life. And we need to talk about how literature reflects a lot of these other important things that are going on. Right. So remember, the formalists don't care about context. They don't want to step outside of the text. But a lot of scholars today would say we have to step outside of the text in order to really show the real world value of the text. You know what the text is actually doing. How is it participating in you know, ongoing conversations or how is it perhaps making a, you know, a political or a cultural statement? Or again, perhaps it's just reflecting change. Uh, or certain developments in society. So, uh, you know, I don't think one approach or, or one style is necessarily better than the other. I think what is good for us as students, we need to be getting pretty comfortable with all of these different styles. So we need to use a little bit of our text-based approaches. We can also use some of our context-based approaches. I think it's great to sort of use a, a variety of tools and, and to also, of course, demonstrate our facility with different styles, different approaches. Okay, and then there's a third category that we're also going to cover, but it won't it, it will not take as long. We can call this the reader based approach or reader oriented critical approaches. This is sort of a smaller category. It mostly just consists of what we call reader response criticism and reception theory. So now the real focus is on the reader. 
And as we're going to see, uh, reader response criticism or theory is, is quite popular. A lot of people use it even if they don't necessarily use the terminology. They might not call what they're doing reader response, but that's largely what we do. I mean, that's what we do in book club. I mean, that's what we do when we're sitting around with friends talking about a book that we read or a movie that we watched or a show that we're currently binging. I mean, reader response, I would argue, is kind of a natural thing. But it all, as a sort of official critical school or approach, it really developed in the 60s. So we're kind of going back in time in our chronology because we're not getting to reader response until week 10 when we're wrapping all of this up. But it really comes up as a response to the new critics who, remember, were very disdainful of the reader. Remember what I was telling you last week about the effective fallacy, right? This idea that we allow our own sort of emotional responses to kind of guide our analysis of text. And, and the New Critics said, you know, just like the author doesn't really matter, historical context doesn't matter, the emotional responses of readers also don't matter. Uh, and sort of the, you know, just the... The, some of the personal feelings or opinions of readers didn't really matter because for the formalists, approaching literature needed to be a rigorous sort of scientific process where we're just arriving at that one right answer by analyzing elements of language. So for them, emotions, that that was just, you know, emotions were just another sort of outside factor, a sort of another external thing that they wanted to cut out. Uh, whereas reader response came up and said, you know, the, the practitioners of it said, you know, it, it's it's absurd to try to cut readers out. <laughs> Literature only works if there are readers. A text only has an impact. A text can really only exist if there are readers to consume it. Um, so it's really a, a nice response to what we've been talking about, and it puts the focus on readers and you know audiences, and in some cases even how certain works of literature get marketed or packaged or presented to a larger public, and that we can also think about the larger impact that a text might have on a reading public. So we can cover that stuff pretty quickly. That's a sort of lighter category just in terms of containing fewer individual schools, you know, compared to context-based or text-based approaches. So in week 10, we'll cover reader response and reception theory, and then we'll sort of wrap up the unit by talking a little bit more about entering critical conversations and conducting the kind of research that we need for our final paper. Um, so we'll just kind of wrap things up in week 10. And I also, well, I, I might actually hold off on the research stuff because another thing I would like to do in week 10 is talk about Cannery Row, which is the novel that we are reading this semester. So that's a good opportunity for me to just kind of remind you guys that we're starting Cannery Row after we come back from spring break. So this week we have some plays to read Next week, we're returning to poetry in week eight. And then after spring break, uh, we start reading Cannery Row in week nine. And I'm going to give you guys about three weeks to finish the book. I don't think you need three full weeks, honestly. It's a pretty short novel, but I just don't want anybody to feel rushed. And we are also, you know, doing discussion posts and talking about criticism and theory in lecture. But Cannery Row might be just an easy book to use as you're applying some of these strategies, some of these approaches, some of these critical schools that we're learning about. You can you can apply some of that stuff to the novel, but of course, by the end of the semester, we're going to have a large body of text that we have read over the course of this semester. Cannery Row is our example of a novel, but we've also read a lot of poetry. We've read several short stories. We're going to read some plays as well. So you'll have a lot of stuff to choose from ultimately when you uh, start working on the literary research paper. But just in the meantime, you can return to any text that we've read as a chance to maybe try to apply uh, 
some of these schools of criticism. Again, application's important. It's one thing to sort of know a little bit about the categories and to know some definitions, but ultimately we need to apply this stuff and actually use this stuff in our own work. So in week 10, we'll be wrapping up all of this stuff and we'll be wrapping up Cannery Row. So then by week 11, we are really starting on our final papers. As you guys can imagine, uh, in a class where there's no midterm and no final exam, obviously the final paper is going to be weighted very heavily. So that's, that, that's our biggest grade and we're going to spend multiple weeks working on the paper. Okay. So now that we know just a little bit about what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, let's back up a little bit and just talk about what literary criticism and literary theory are, like what those terms mean and where this stuff came from. So we can really track the origins of literary criticism all the way back to the ancient world, really in the Western tradition, you know, if we're talking about the Western world, uh, you know, it's hard to separate the development of literature from the development of the interpretation, analysis, and discussion of literature. The two sort of go hand in hand. So as long as we've had literary texts, we've had people analyzing, talking about, writing about those texts, and, and trying to interpret those texts. So there's a long lineage here going all the way back to ancient Greece, you know, all the way back to uh, classic antiquity. Uh, and in the early days, you know, magic and religion sort of played a big role in interpreting texts. So in some cases, you know, they, the ancient Greeks would turn to oracles or people who were believed to sort of have psychic powers uh, and they were thought to be able to interpret dreams or written text. And then in the case of like religious texts as well, those often needed to be read a certain way, right, or interpreted. There was often this idea of embedded meaning or some kind of encoded language that needed to be figured out, uh, decoded, sort of explicated, explained, and interpreted. And there were certain people, often people who were thought to have mystical or magical abilities, who were turned to as, as people who could do that kind of work. So we are inheriting the mantle from them. But also we have to remember that interpreting text has kind of a religious basis as well. Because we've been analyzing and interpreting religious texts since antiquity, and certainly the Bible has often been analyzed in our sort of Western tradition. So interpreting religious texts, like the Bible, is known as exegesis. And that's kind of an important term just for this larger history, because exegesis is largely looked at as kind of like the original form or style of literary criticism and theory because again this is all about interpreting understanding a text now if we are religious we might not view the bible as a work of literature but there's obviously a lot of narratives in there there are a lot of literary elements at work even if we don't necessarily regard the text as literary uh, or as an example of literature. So we can see how a lot of our stuff, a lot of the things that we've been learning about, how it could obviously be applied to a religious text. Uh, so again, exegesis was very much focused on figuring out encoded language, interpreting figurative language and symbolism, sort of making sense of a lot of that and arriving at original interpretive conclusions. Basically explaining what the author meant, explaining what this symbol represents, what does this metaphor really mean, <laughs> uh, what about this particular word choice, why is the author using this word, what's the hidden meaning, uh, going beneath the surface, finding deeper meanings. Again, a lot of stuff that we still do, a lot of stuff that we would consider to be pretty standard techniques 
uh, of literary analysis, a lot of that sort of does come from exegesis. But also going back to sort of the ancient world and the, and the medieval world, another source for a lot of our sort of analytical techniques was the study of legal texts. So a lot of historians or scholars will say it was kind of these are the twin influences, you know, kind of religion and legal text, because religious text and legal text have to be interpreted, right? They have to be sort of analyzed and explained to a certain extent. I have a quote here about legal texts, uh, but again, this is similar to religious text in the sense that they are indirectly accessible by nature. That's kind of an interesting phrase to think about. They are indirectly accessible. So anybody can sit down and read them, but not everybody is going to necessarily understand them. And if you've ever tried to read like a legal brief and you don't have a background in the law, and I definitely don't, it's hard to understand. I need somebody to help me to decode that text and to understand what it means. So because they are indirectly accessible, what that means is they demand interpretation. They demand to be interpreted. And typically, at least in the past, they would have been interpreted by, you know, experts, people who had been trained to do that kind of work. So religious and legal discourses have always kind of had an impact or an influence on literary study. And they're also where we get that basic term interpretation. Uh, sort of, you know, that again comes from religious texts and legal texts. But we're doing the same kind of work with our literary text. We are figuring out what they mean, what they do. And as we know, literature can be difficult to read and understand. There's often hidden meanings. There's often codes and patterns that we have to sort of decipher. So again, if you if you find a person, you know, who's somebody who's never read literature, a young person who hasn't perhaps been exposed to literature, they're going to have a difficult time with a poem. Just like I'm going to have a difficult time with a legal brief, <laughs> or we might have a difficult time with ancient religious texts, right? All of those texts demand interpretation. They're not always completely transparent. They're not always easy for anyone to just sit down and understand. So, you know, just kind of keep the larger history in mind. And now let's make a, a key distinction when we're talking about literary study in general. Let's make a key distinction between criticism on one hand and theory on the other. So I'll give you a couple of definitions, starting with literary criticism. So for us, literary criticism means the analysis, interpretation, and sometimes the evaluation of literary texts. Pretty simple. The analysis, interpretation, and sometimes evaluation of literary texts. Okay, so that's literary criticism. And again, as we're going to see, there's lots of different schools, lots of different approaches to literary criticism. All right, now, on the other hand, we have literary theory. So here's the definition for that. Literary theory is a distinct academic discipline influenced heavily by philosophy, philosophy and linguistics. And typically, literary theory will analyze the philosophical and methodological premises of literature. So not just necessarily interpreting meaning, but often more interested in the philosophical underpinnings or the methodological uh, premises, right? Like the, the methods used, the structures used uh, to actually create the text. So there's a difference here, right? Literary theory is an entire academic discipline, and it draws very heavily on other disciplines like philosophy and like linguistics. Okay, and again, we're analyzing more than just what the text means, 
We're also interested in the philosophical and methodological premises of the literature. So sometimes that can take us in very different directions than just literary criticism. And another thing that can be a little tricky is sometimes literary theory can be used to study or analyze literary criticism, <laughs> right? So sometimes the literary criticism itself becomes the subject of a sort of theoretical deep dive into the origins and premises of a particular critical school or approach. So theory can be used to study actual literary texts, but it can also be used to study criticism. So it gets a little complicated, and as if that's not enough, there's not always a really clear dividing line between criticism and theory. So like I've said, the two often do bleed over into one another a little bit. A lot of literary criticism will use certain aspects of theory. But not always. <laughs> sometimes not always. Oftentimes, but not always. And then sometimes works of theory will have sort of a critical function. Like they will be sort of utilized in a similar way to what we would normally see with literary criticism. You know, they're used to provide interpretation of a text. Uh, but sometimes they can function more like criticism of the criticism as opposed to criticism of the literature. So it does get complicated, but just keep in mind that theory and criticism are slightly different. They often bleed over into one another. There, there's a lot of carryover between the two. And again, a lot of literary criticism, a lot of the individual schools of criticism will be borrowing from certain theoretical traditions or certain uh, you know, other disciplines or other theories. So we can track that a little bit. But if remember, theory is often used for a lot of different stuff, right? It can be used for literature, but it can also be used to really examine the larger critical apparatus that we often use in our study of literature. So our relationship with theory at this level can remain somewhat distant, uh, as long as we are comfortable with some of the critical schools. Because if you're using some of the critical schools, you are at least indirectly using a little bit of theory as well. Okay, so that's pretty much the main stuff that I wanted you guys to know as sort of a larger overview. But now let's just talk a little bit about sort of joining a critical conversation. I'll, I'll return to this concept when we really get up and running on our research papers, when we really start working on them around week 11. But this is probably something that you guys have heard before in a previous English class, this idea of joining a critical conversation. Uh, we, we sometimes use a metaphor. I use this in my 102 classes, but I think it works for any English class that incorporates research. I, I use the metaphor of a party. Maybe you've heard this before, perhaps from me or something similar from somebody else. But you know, when you're writing a research paper, when you are conducting research, trying to learn more about a particular topic, whether it's literary or if it's a more sort of traditional research paper in 102, where you're just learning about sort of a current event or some hot button topic, uh, we always can think of it as kind of, you know, you're, you're going to a party. The, the process of learning about this topic, this process of researching and gathering information can be compared to going to a party. So you show up at a, at a party, there's already a lot of people there, right? Perhaps you've had this experience if, you've arrived, if you're arriving a little bit late. Uh, there's already people present at the party and a lot of people are talking. So when you walk into the room, there's a lot of conversations that are already ongoing. And at some point, you're going, to, you're, you're going to want to join one of those conversations, maybe multiple conversations. But there's kind of a process that you have to follow. If you're, if you're a little late to the party and people are already having conversations, you really have to sort of listen a little bit before you can jump into one. 
So this is how we can sort of think about research and learning more about what other critics and scholars have said about our chosen text, whatever text it is that we think we want to write about. So before we can enter those conversations, we have to listen to others. And that's like the equivalent of doing research, reading articles or book chapters, and just you know, gathering more information, enhancing your own knowledge, and just seeing what other people have done, hearing what other people have to say. Uh, and once you've done enough of that kind of work, once you've listened and learned, you are ready to join the conversations. And now you can start to offer your own opinions. Uh, now you have an informed opinion because you've read, you've listened, you've learned. So now you can join the conversation and you can agree with some people, disagree with others, and advance your own original argument. So it's kind of a goofy metaphor, but it might help to think about what we really need to do with our literary research paper. So I know you guys have some experience doing research using hopefully the library databases, maybe stuff like Google Scholar as well. <laughs> hopefully you've done that in previous classes. So we'll talk about it a little bit later in the semester, but I just want to emphasize that you guys are going to need to read the work of literary scholars. You're going to need to read articles, not entire books necessarily. I know we're all busy, but you might be able to read some individual chapters within larger books, but articles are often the name of the game for literary study. There's lots and lots of academic journals devoted to literature, devoted to the study of literature. So you're going to find a lot of what you need in those types of academic journals. So you're going to read what other scholars have done, what other scholars have said. And in the process, you're going to notice what kinds of critical approaches have been used on your chosen text. So over the course of your research, you might notice that a lot of scholars have used the feminist approach, or maybe people have taken uh, a structuralist approach to the text, or maybe a new historicist uh, critical approach has often been used. You're going to notice that, or there could be a wide variety of different approaches, and not every scholar that you read will be easily categor categorizable. You won't be able to necessarily say, oh, well, this person's, it's not always so easy to say, well, this person's a new historicist, this person's using the feminist school, this person's doing this other thing. A lot of scholars will mix and match. They'll use different approaches. They'll combine different critical approaches. So it's not always as easy as I might make it sound, but you are going to notice some of the, the schools that we are discussing, some of these different critical schools, they're going to show up as you research, as you read more. So it's just important that we, that we read the good stuff, that we focus on the scholars, the literary historians, you know, in some cases we might view, you know, we might be looking at some stuff written by critics because, again, there can be a little bit of a fine line between a critic and a scholar. Both can engage in literary criticism. Uh, and in some cases, you know, critics might work for uh, newspapers or major media outlets. And, you know, that might get us more into the realm of like book reviews. A lot of that stuff is more evaluative. So if you go back to my definition of literary criticism, I said analysis, interpretation, and sometimes evaluation. So depending on who you ask, some kind of old school lit people will say, oh, it's not really our job to evaluate. That's for the people who write book reviews, like in the New York Times, right? That, that's not for scholars. Scholars analyze and interpret, and we leave it to the public, we leave it to others to decide if a work of literature is good or not. Uh, <laughs> that can sometimes be considered to be a separate undertaking. But plenty of scholars, plenty of academic uh, scholars, people who work in the academic field of literary study, they will engage in evaluation. They will weigh in on how effective a particular work of literature is. But oftentimes that evaluative function is, is viewed as less important as analysis analysis. 
interpretation, sort of figuring out meaning, figuring out how the text works, and then perhaps providing some opinion or evaluation as sort of a, a secondary or tertiary uh, concern. So again, there, there's, there's overlap, but what I want us to get into is really reading scholars, reading lit scholars, people who have studied lit, written about lit, teach lit for a living. Uh, these are largely the people that we want to consult when we're doing a lot of our research. So this is just kind of a, a, a long-winded way of saying that I want you guys to start maybe cutting out some of the sources that we have maybe used in the past. So, you know, websites, certain summary websites, uh, things that give us basic overviews or recaps of texts. I can't stop you guys from using those sites. And if they are helpful as you're navigating a chosen text, that's fine. I mean, if you need something cleared up, if there's a particular plot point that you're not quite clear about, or if you just want to make sure that you understand exactly what happens in terms of the narrative, you know, you can consult those summary sites, but they're not going to help you perform analysis. They're not going to ultimately provide you with the kind of evidence that you're going to need on the literary research paper. So again, you can, you know, glance at those sites, but I don't want us to regard those kinds of sites as potential sources. All right, stuff that mostly exists to explain texts to undergrads, right? That that has its play. There's obviously a market for websites like that, but those are not reliable academic sources. Those are not scholarly sources for us. So, you know, we can use them for our own just personal understanding, but at some point we need to graduate and start looking at the scholars. What have the scholars said? about the literature. And we certainly don't have to agree with all of the scholarship that we read. Again, that's part of entering a larger conversation. You're going to find some scholars that you agree with. You're going to find some that you strongly disagree with. And that's fine. That's good. Uh, but you have to read them. You have to get acquainted with their views before you can start to form those opinions. So for those of you who are pursuing English as a major and those of you who might be thinking about graduate school, you know, you're going to eventually have to get more and more familiar with a lot of these critical schools. And at some point, you're going to have to kind of pick your allegiance <laughs> to, to one or maybe at least a, a general category. So again, a lot of people will sort of define themselves as more text-based or perhaps more context-based. And you sort of use the schools within those larger categories. But yeah, usually by the end of grad school, you sort of have to figure out like what what sort of critical apparatus am I going to use in my own work, in my own career? And again, you don't just have to pick one. But I can remember being very much on the fence. I didn't have a lot of strong preferences in my own uh, schooling days. So when it came time to choose, I just ended up choosing new historicism largely, and that's an example of one of those context-based approaches. But I chose it not because I think context-based is always better than text-based, but because really it was just based on my subject matter, what I was writing about. Not that you guys need to know much about it or care much, but since I was working with a lot of early American literature, uh, I was very much steeped in history. Um, so I ended up leaning towards using a lot of the history, but new historicism, and we'll talk about this in week nine, uh, new historicism differs from the old way of doing historical context. So like I said, historical, the, the historical approach is one of those older traditional approaches to lit, like the biographical approach that we don't always use so much anymore, uh, at least that old-fashioned way of just thinking about historical context as a very black and white, clear-cut thing. New historicism, the reason it's new, or it was new when it developed in the 80s, like I said, a lot of these context-based approaches came, or came about during the 80s and 90s, and they continue to be very popular into the 2000s. So the idea with new historicism was, okay, yeah, we're still interested in history, but unlike the old-fashioned historical approach, the new historical approach is going to recognize that history works a lot like literature. 
right? In the old days, history was the true stuff and literature was the made up stuff. And that was the distinction that they worked with. But now, if you're a new historicist, you regard history as being very literary in the way that it's written, in the way that it's often presented. And this kind of makes sense. You know, we, we learn things best as humans if the information is presented in narrative form. So history is usually presented in the form of narrative, like a story, right? Characters, plot, setting, themes. Uh, so new historicists argue that it's not so much that literature borrows from history or only works to reflect history, but instead literature and history have this kind of complex, symbiotic, kind of very intertwined relationship where history borrows from literature, literature borrows from history, uh, and it can be sometimes difficult to extricate the two. So anyway, that's, we, we'll get into that more in a couple of weeks, but I ended up sort of adopting a new historicist approach to my dissertation and some of my other work because that just worked best for what I was doing. My subject matter, my chosen text, my time period, it just made sense to use a new historicist kind of critical apparatus. But other people chose different approaches in different styles based on their own preferences, based on what they were working with, and just based on yeah, often what you like best. I've always liked history, so it was kind of a natural thing for me. So you guys don't have to pick your allegiance by the end of this semester, but you should have at least some familiarity with all of these different schools so you have a base of knowledge that you can build on in the future. Okay, so I think that's good enough for today. We'll keep this lecture somewhat short because I'll, our upcoming weeks will probably be longer. So again, next week, we'll start with our text-based approaches. That means formalism, structuralism, and post-structuralism. So we'll cover those next week. And let me know if you guys have any issues with uh, acquiring Cannery Row. Hopefully you already have the book by now, but if you don't and you're having an issue, get in touch because I do want you guys to start reading that after spring break. But in the meantime, this week we're going to read a couple of plays. I've given you guys a choice between two plays. We haven't read any drama yet this semester, but if you remember 203, uh, drama is sort of the third major type of literature. So we've already seen some examples of poetry. We've seen examples of prose fiction so far only in the form of short stories, but we're going to read a novel as well. So we'll also experience drama to go along with prose and poetry. So we'll have a, uh, so we have a week for drama. Uh, and then I believe we have another, no, nope, we only have one week devoted to drama, I think. And then in week eight, you guys will read some poetry, and then our final required uh, reading is Cannery Row. So after Cannery Row, you, know, you can continue to read whatever you want in the book, but we don't have any more assigned readings after the novel, because after the novel, we are just focused on the literary research paper. Okay, so if you have any questions about the schedule, let me know. If you have questions about the novel, let me know. Or if you have any questions about any of our material, we can always talk more. If you feel a little bit lost, if my lectures are not clarifying things, we can always talk more, schedule a video conference. Okay, I will see you next week.